Hey everybody, this is Melissa Furness and um, you know, I'm teaching painting one this semester and I have, you know, quite a full class of students and I, I'm feeling kind of bad that I'm not able to give them all the personal attention that I'd like just because I need to make sure I get around to everyone in the room and so oh, it seems like I'm totally frantic in class and so what I wanted to do is to try to give students a little bit extra of something in terms of instruction for starting out with painting and you know help students to see that you know I'm not always just this mad person running around. I'm gonna do a little bit of video demo um, first with a couple of exercises. So the first one is just really you know about color mixing. Um, most students are gonna be using oil paint. I use that in my own practice and so something that I really really love to do and um, you know, so I'm excited to show you, you know, how that process works. And, and really what we need to do is begin by playing around with color mixing. And then also, you know, try starting out with the basics, you know, mapping out proportion and scale with the still life, figuring out what an underpainting is, things like that, which are, you know, I suppose pretty straightforward, but also uh, surprisingly, um, you know, challenging at certain times in terms of how you use the tools. So I'm here to help you out. Um, so let's get going. Okay, so we're gonna get started with this basic color mixing exercise. So before I begin doing anything with oil painting, you always have to do a somewhat a bit of preparation and that involves preparing a surface. So keep in mind that water and oil do not mix and so anything that is water-based always has to come first has to be fully dry before you apply any oil paint or any kind of painting, oil painting medium to that surface. So that's what I'm gonna be starting with. Um, just a couple of other like basic notes is that um, when I'm working in the studio, I make mess. So I have these uh, aprons that I always use when I'm starting to work. So, hey, I might be like Mr. Rogers and instead of putting on my lovely sweater, I'm going to put on my apron every day <laughs> um, and then get to work, right? So I've got my apron. A um, couple other things you need is that uh, we're going to be working on paper. You know, we're just starting now, probably going to make mistakes. So just working on paper is fine. You can do an oil painting on paper, which maybe you didn't know. I mean, if you just go straight with paper and um, and put oil straight on the paper, you know that that's not a good way to go. You can, if you put oil straight on the paper, it's just gonna like soak into it, create some residual oil, and the paper is gonna eventually, you know, erode. Uh, so what we have to do is give it a coat of something. So um, to start with these first two sort of preliminary pieces, we're gonna be uh, working on an 18 by 24 inch sheet of paper. We'll be doing two. Um, this will be one that I'm showing you as an example. Um, so I have my paper scissors. Um, this is gesso. Um, there's all sorts of different types of gesso. Um, honestly, this is my favorite kind, um, Utrecht Artist Gesso. Um, it is thick when you open it up on the lid, so it's meant so that you add a little bit of water to it, and so that really kind of extends the life. It's not just a gallon, it's maybe like a gallon and a quarter, a gallon and a half, um, and I'm also able to spread it around on the surface a little bit more when I add water. I mean, just a, like, you know, basic rule in general is that, like, if first off, if you have fringe on your paper, um, cut it off. Part of, you know, what you need to be concerned with as an artist is presentation. So it is important to pay attention to little details like this, even if it is, you know, kind of a test piece or a study, you still want to present it well and start to think about how we're going to be as professional artists when we get to that point. I'll put this down on a board of some sort. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a drawing board. You can, you know, tape it down to the floor, tape it down to the wall. Anything that's kind of a hard surface will work. Um, I have masking tape here. Certainly there's different types of masking tape. Um, so try to find something that is strong and will hold well. So you can get this at Home Depot, maybe that's the best place for it. Um, but take note that I'm taping this down on all four edges. And honestly, even though I'm just, I'm doing oil painting today, 
even if I were making like a drawing, for instance, and adding any sort of wet media, before I add any wet media, this is what I do. This is the same as kind of like stretching a canvas. So that, you know, when you add the wet media, you'll see that the paper bubbles up. Uh, but as it dries, it'll flatten out again just because you, you've stretched it with that tape, you've held it down to a surface. So that's super important. If you don't do that, you're gonna end up with like a, a ripply, wavy kind of sheet of paper, and that's not terribly easy to work with in terms of presenting yourself, but also like just painting in general. With this, you know, I have a cup of water. I have a gesso brush. This is kind of a wide brush. It's it, This one is two inches wide, which is I one I like to use. I kind of like the angle on this one. And then I have my gesso. So I'm just going to um, give this one coat and then I'm going to let it dry and I'm going to give it a second coat. So make sure that you do let it dry between layers and coating this paper with gesso is super important before you start doing any oil painting. Um, so I'm going to do one of these for my mixing exercise and then I'm going to do a second one uh, when it, for my first painting since I'm pretending I'm a beginner. Um, so I can try out the process without feeling like, oh gosh, I've spent loads of money on a surface, which, you know, certain surfaces can cost quite a bit. Um, so we're going to kind of work our way up to that as we get better with our process and with painting. <laughs> Okay, so I've got one coat of gesso on this piece of paper. It's wet, it's gonna take a little while to dry. So I'm gonna let it sit. I'm gonna really get that lid sealed onto my gesso so I can come back to it later. My brush is in water and I will see you in a bit. I'm going to do a second coat, keep that in mind, even though I might not show it on the video. Um, so two coats of gesso, super important, and then we're going to be ready to paint. Okay, so now I've got two coats of gesso on my sheet of paper. Uh, it's still taped down, so leave it taped down. Um, if you had to lift it up, you could take it down to a new surface, but just make sure it's adhered well. And then now I'm going to start experimenting with mixing color. So a basic artist palette contains... 12 colors, which I've got here. Um, and so what we're going to do is create kind of a grid uh, that I have mapped out here on this sheet and um, mix colors, uh, complementary colors kind of across one another on the color wheel, you know, as we go to see how they kind of gray as if they get blended together. Um, this is going to show you a lot about how color works and the undertones of your colors. So, um, I also made a template. I've got, you know, eight colors I'm going to do across here and seven up and down. Um, don't make that mistake. I did that in the beginning, so I added another square on just to make sure I get it right this time. So, then what you want to do is you want to, you know, grab a pencil. This is helpful to have this guide because, you know, it's going to um, have all the squares evenly measured out for you. These are two inch squares we're going to be painting on the surface. And then um, with this, along with just kind of studying, you know, how our own colors work, we're also going to, you know, write down, you know, the name brand of the color of paint that we're using and also make a, make a comparison, you know, with what other kinds of paints other students are using. So we can kind of see, you know, the differences in the color according to the brand of paint and also the, the name of the paint. There's a few students doing acrylics um, as well. So the color of paint that I am using, the brand of paint that I'm using, is called Holbein. And it's my favorite. It's a Japanese, you know, brand of paint. Um, however, it is a little bit expensive, so if you're just starting out, you know, it might be a little bit more of an investment, but it's, if you feel like committed to becoming an amazing painter, maybe you would just want to start out with a really 
nice set of colors. It's up to you. So I'm, I, I kind of drew a line around my template, as you saw with my pencil. And now I'm taping down the edges because I want to make a nice clean grid. And then once I get the tape down, I'm going to mark some measurements down on there. So I did talk to everyone about, you know, the differences between, you know, student gray color and also professional color. Um, so with my template, you can see I've marked, you know, the two inch squares and so i'm going to do that on my tape once i've got it taped down um, and then i'll mark it here so that i can easily get that grid structure without having to keep measuring all the time so you could do this with pencil or with uh, a sharpie it, whatever you can see more easily i'll just work with a greasier pencil instead <laughs> So as I do this, I'm going to show you, you know, a couple of small artist tricks as we go. So, you know, in order to create a nice, crisp, clean edge on something, you can actually kind of tape it down and then seal off the tape with a medium. I mean, if, like I said, if you're doing oils, you always have to do, you know, whatever's water-based first. So I use this fluid matte medium. So what I can do is let's say I'm going to start my first row of color mixing. I'm going to draw and, and put my tape down in a line straight here on this first bit. Um, and I'm going to um, just seal off the edge of the tape so that I can have a nice clean edge on that area. Um, I think I might do that actually, you know, all along at once and then be done with the water-based media and move on to oil. So I can only do that on one edge, but that's okay. At least, at least I'll be able to get it, you know, looking fairly good on the one edge and have a nice clean grid for my, my experiment here in, in mixing the color. So I have this big jug, but I also have some of this over here in a container. And then I'll take a smaller brush. And this is totally clear and matte. So I'm just going to like go over the edge of the tape to the paper so that when I go back with the oil, it's not going to seep underneath the tape. And it'll create like a really cool clean edge for me when I remove the tape, which you'll see later. So I'm just going to do that throughout. You can't see this because this is totally clear medium, but you'll see the effects when I go over through this process. When I do this on the, the next section, I'm only going to do this one edge and maybe a little bit of the bottom. The other edge doesn't matter because I'm going to be taking it off as I go. And when we get to doing a later project, you know, this process of getting the clean edge is going to be useful because we're going to be playing around with what it's like to do hard edge painting as well. So remember that this is water based. So once I get this done, I have to let it sit and dry, you know, at least a good 30, 40 minutes, and then I can start in with my oil painting. Um, a couple of other things is that when I switch to oil painting, uh, I'm gonna switch to using a solvent, and I will explain that shortly about like how to handle the solvent. But keep in mind that, you know, when I use acrylic and I have something water-based, I leave the brush in the water until I get the moment to, to wash the brush when you do with oils, you don't have to do that because it's not going to dry out straight away. And you don't really want to leave, you know, the oil, the brush in a solvent because it'll start to eat away at the bristles on your brush. And you also want to make sure that you're not using water when, once you switch to oil. 
Now, once you go to oil, you're going to use only solvent as your thinner. Because, like I said, oil and water don't mix. And, you know, everyone makes mistakes also, just so you know. I'm trying to give you as thorough information as I can. Because, you know, I know everyone makes innocent mistakes by accident. And I'm here to help you feel, let you know the process and it can be more confident as you proceed as a painter. Okay, I'm gonna let that sit and dry and then I'll come back to doing oil painting again. Now I'm back. My acrylic base on these is dry so I don't have to worry about messing anything up. Now I'm going to set anything acrylic aside so I don't accidentally grab it. And um, what I have are you know my paints but before we even start you know thinking about painting we need to have our solvent ready to go so this is terpenoid this is what i use it's odorless which is very helpful there is some stuff called like terpenoid natural but it, it's pretty smelly um so unless you can like have an open space outdoors we have quite a few students together working in one studio so we don't want to have the smell so then you want to take like a you know like a spaghetti jar um so always save those if you have pasta and then you want to fill your jar so keep in mind that you're not going to be dumping this out you're going to be using it over and over again every time you paint until it gets so dirty you can't paint anymore so i'm going to put a little bit more in because it does evaporate a little bit over time so i've got like about two-thirds full on this and um, right now it looks a little bit cloudy but you can see it's a bit darker at the bottom underneath. That's where the sludge kind of settles down. So each time, you know, you go away, you put it in the cupboard. Um, for us in um, the painting studio, we're going to be putting it in a hazmat bin so it's safe. So it'll sit for a while and then the sludge will kind of settle to the bottom and then you'll have this clear stuff at the top that you can then paint with. So that's what you'll use. Definitely not water, okay? Um, and then you want to use a palette. So these are just disposable palette sheets. In general, it's good to have, you know, one of those lockable cases, you know, so that you can um, not waste your paint because if you don't have something to cover it, then it dries out super quickly. Whereas if you had a case, um, you can actually like preserve the paint for a few days and keep working with it. So at home in the studio by myself, you know, I have a piece of glass and I put a a cover over the top of it and that helps keep it wet for a good number of days so I can keep coming back and reusing that paint. I have this sort of chart guide that I'm working with but to start you know we're gonna have a line of each color mixed with 50% titanium white um, and then on this end we're gonna have kind of the yellows and reds so we have uh, we want to have a cool yellow so for me that's a a yellow a lemon yellow so it could also be like a cadmium yellow light a cadmium lemon yellow Hansa yellow light those are kind of cool light yellows and then you want to have a middle yellow for me it's cadmium medium so that would go here um, and then you want an earth yellow which is yellow ochre um, and then this center one is going to be two squares because we're going to mix it with two different colors down here um, but that will be your sort of middle red color, which is for me, a perylene red. It could be naphthol red, cadmium red, medium, naphthol scar scarlet. And you have a darker red, kind of a cooler red. This is alizarin crimson for me. It could also be quinacridone, um, uh, red for you. Um, and then you want a middle kind of warm brown for, and that would be burnt sienna. And then you want a cooler brown, which would be your raw umber. So that's what I'm going to mix across the top. Then at the bottom, I'm going to have fewer colors, but they're going to be kind of our blues uh, and greens and purples. So this is going to be, you know, again, mixed with white across here, 50%. Uh, and then I'm going to have dioxazine violet or dioxazine purple. I'm going to have uh, ultramarine blue, which is kind of a neutral blue, kind of warm blue. Phthalo blue is traditionally kind of a cooler blue. It sort of depends on the brand. Um, so we'll see how it works out. And then we're going to have, um, oh, actually, no, before we do the, the 
the uh, cooler blue, we're going to do a viridian, which is a green. So it'll go kind of like this as I'm mixing it. And then, you know, whatever kind of brush you want to use is up to you. Um, just a little bit. Uh, I'll talk as I go, actually. Um, so I'm going to grab a brush. You know, I want one that's not, like, too small because I want to be able to, like, cover this and not, like, waste a bunch of time with a teeny tiny brush. Um, so we'll see what I have here. You know, as a professional artist, you collect a lot of paint, as you can see. So I'm going to grab a couple different, or brushes, sorry, and paint, actually. I actually have way more paint over here. See, this is my, the rest of my other paint. <laughs> um, so I love, you know, collecting different colors. So at the top, I'm going to start with my permanent yellow. Um, I'll put a, when you work with oils, you don't need that much. So I'm just going to put a tiny bit on my palette. And I'm just going to put, you know, that 100% color, which is going to be my second square here. The other thing I want to do is, like, try to get my measurements correct. So I'm going to use my guide and lay it down across this second bit of tape and just make those tick marks so that I'm, you know, trying to do the two inch square across there. There, so then I have a little bit of a measurement. And then I can, you don't need a lot of solvent, maybe just a little bit to help you make your brush brush on a little bit smoother. So I just kind of like dab it on the palette a little bit. And then I want to get a nice solid understanding of what that color looks like. So the joy of working with oils is that a little bit goes a long way. Um, and that's why oil paints are more expensive. So just keep that in mind when you make that decision about whether or not you want to paint with acrylics or oils. Oils may have a few drawbacks, but they also have lots of positive things that make them fun to work with. So I'm trying to make this kind of a solid yellow so I know exactly how that color looks for me. Um, the reason that I choose Holbein paint is because it has like the strongest color, the strongest pigment content, um, and creates really beautiful, bright, vibrant tones for me. And then I, that really comes across in my work as I am painting. Okay, so then the one above it, I'm gonna mix with 50% white. I may put a little bit more white out on my palette because I'm gonna mix it with both the yellow as well as some other colors around it. So I don't wanna contaminate it by using this brush. I wanna use a palette knife so I can take, you know, a little bit of the white and mix it with, you know, 50% of the yellow. Get a little bit more yellow there. And then just mix that up and then I'll paint that on. Here you have a little bit of a closer view. Hopefully you can see that okay on camera versus in real life when you can see it more easily. So what white does, anytime you add white to a color, it's going to automatically make it much more opaque. So the straight lemon yellow out of the tube is actually quite transparent just with its own properties and adding white or even black, which I never use, but um, both of those are opaque and are going to both dull your color as well as make it um, have greater covering power. So um, those are just two things to think about when you add white to something. And, you know, you try to kind of refrain from white until closer towards the end so you can try to keep as rich a color as possible. So my other color down here is going to be my, my dioxazine violet. So I think I'm going to put that brush down and grab a fresh one to try to just, you know, keep my color fresh, get a little bit of the purple. And that's going to be my second square from up from the bottom. Okay. So as I'm painting here, a couple other notes about like the quality of your paint. So um, keep in mind that, you know, student grade paints, yes, they are cheaper, but the thing about them is that they have, they contain fillers. So the re that's the reason that they're cheaper. So what they have is basically, you know, creating the same size of a tube of paint, but um, 
it, the paint has like additives and also like things like chalk or other things that actually like um, evaporate um, or um, have lesser color or lesser pigment content. So a student grade paint would have like, I don't know, 40%, 40-45% pigment content versus a, a professional paint, grade paint is, might have like more like 60%. So that's the reason that it's more expensive. But as a result, you use less paint when it's something that's a professional quality paint versus a student grade paint. Um, you use more in order to get, you know, the same um, uh, type of quality of coverage on your painting itself. So, you know, it's not really cheaper in the, in the long term if you think about it. Um, so I have my palette knife, but painting rags are super important to always have. So I can reuse this palette knife just by wiping it with my rag. And then again, grabbing some white to do my 50-50 with the purple, right? So purple is a darker value. So you're gonna see, you know, a change from adding the white to this one versus a little bit more so than you did with the yellow just because of the dark value and we're using white to lighten it up 50% basically, whereas yellow was already light and you're adding another light to it. So it was dulling it, making it have more, more covering power, but you won't see as much difference in the overall tone when I paint the square. Like you can see there, there's not as much actual visible difference um, versus this purple one, you're really gonna see a pretty clear difference in this square versus the other one I just painted. Um, so with this, since this is dark purple, I'm gonna just wipe it with my rag a bit here um, and dip in the... So you don't want too much terpenoid in there. You just use that to kind of allow it to smooth on with the brush a little bit more easily. And so you see there, there's a a more distinct difference between this square and the one that I painted previously because of the value. So as I proceed, I'm going to start to mix the purple and the yellow together and see what happens. So, you know, according to color theory rules, you know, colors opposite one another on the color wheel will sort of neutralize each other. So neutralizing, you know, they could end up being gray or even brown or greenish looking. So we'll see what happens with these two colors. And this is gonna tell us a lot more about, you know, the individual nature of them. So um, this is gonna be 75% yellow, 25% purple. And this will be 20, 75% purple, 25% yellow. And this is gonna be 50-50 of the two colors. So we'll start up here with the yellow. So more yellow, less purple. You have to, I know we don't have like a way to exactly measure this, but we're doing our best to kind of get a good handle on how much purple versus yellow we're adding, right? It's a tiny bit of purple. And then three times that of yellow. Mix that together and that will be an interesting color. We'll see. A bit grayish. So it's kind of getting to be a nice neutral color. So even though this is 75% yellow, look at how dark it got because the value of the purple naturally is much darker than the yellow. So that's why it did that. Other colors won't necessarily do that because some colors have equal value to each other like red and, red and green do. So as we do this, not only are you gonna learn how to mix your colors, but you're also gonna learn, you know, a good bit about color theory. So I'm trying to get as even a tone as I can because as we know, you know, the yellow has a good bit of transparency to it as does the purple. So try to control your brush stroke a bit. So the two mixing them together, they are kind of dulling each other, neutralizing each other a bit here. 
It's also becoming quite dark. That's a pretty nice neutral color there. Okay, so that's 50-50. And so if we have more purple than just a little bit of yellow, I suspect it's going to be quite dark. So if you're using a different brand of paint, don't worry if yours looks different than mine. I suspect that it may. Um, and that's part of what we're discovering here in trying out this process of, you know, the real distinct differences between these kind of brands of paint. So then we really can fully understand how each one works, right? This one is really very similar to the other one I mixed. It does have a little bit more vivid quality of the purple. It may be hard to see on the camera, but I'll try to zoom in in a bit here once I finish. You notice that I put the lid on my terpenoid whenever I'm not using it. You can see pretty well. I'm going to zoom in further. So there's my first lineup of color, lemon yellow to dioxazine purple. Um, so if you look closely, you can certainly see a difference. Try to get some more light on there between each one of these colors, particularly those darker ones I was looking at show, trying to show you. So there's that. Then the other thing I want to show you is what it's like when I lift off my, my tape on my edge. So I want to lift off just this one side, but you can see since I sealed it in, it has such a nice, clean, crisp edge. It's kind of satisfying actually to do that. Oops, might tear a little bit, but that's okay. So just be careful as you lift that tape up. Again, no one's perfect, right? That's okay. <laughs> Definitely not me, as we've seen me make mistakes in class, right? All right, um, so that looks beautiful. So um, now I'm gonna get ready for the next colors. It's gonna be the purple again, but this time mixing it with uh, cadmium yellow, which is a little bit warmer than that lemon yellow. So we'll see if there's a difference in what those middle tones turn out looking like dip into the medium and kind of just clear out my brushes from that color I'd been painting with. So I wipe and wipe my palette knife. I use a lot of paint rags, so, you know, keep your eyes peeled for any old clothes, go to the thrift store, pick up really super cheap things you can use as rags. I don't know, t-shirt, these cotton t-shirts work so great. Um, other kinds of fabrics aren't as easy to work with, but you know, any old clothes I don't wear anymore. I just pretty much throw them in a box and, and use them as painting stuff, right? I want to get that cleared out as well as I can because I want to try to get that nice fresh yellow color. So sometimes I like dip into a color I'm not using anymore just to try to clear out the brush and, and then put it back into the medium and then wipe it again. It'll help to lighten it up for me so it's not stuck with all that purple. Okay, so now I'm gonna do straight cadmium yellow. Straightforward yellow goes here. So, you know, I sealed in this edge and this, that other edge is already clean so I can just, you know, paint up to the edge of the clean edge and then go off the edge of the, of the taped one. Oh, the other thing I forgot is that I want to, again, grab my guide, put those tick marks on that tape so I get it measured correctly.
as you're doing this, you're going to notice that certain colors have more power or more kind of, you know, opaque pigment or color than others. Like cadmium yellow is a really kind of strong color with a lot of like beautiful pigment quality to it. And so you'll notice that, you know, it just adding a little bit of purple doesn't quite as affect that color as it as much as it did when I was doing the lemon yellow, which has a little bit less, you know, coloring power than the uh, cadmium does, which is why cadmium, when you buy a tube of cadmium, tends to be a lot more expensive than the other colors. It's just a greater richness of that pigment. And then the other thing I've noticed is that you know, as you're mixing this and applying it to the paper, you know, you get another sensitivity about like a balance between like how wet and how dry the paint should be to kind of get an even tone, like just a little bit of solvent, you know, and if it gets too wet, then you kind of have to rub it, you know, wipe it with the rag a little bit. And that those things are kind of very small sensitivities that, you know, you have to learn by doing. You know, you have to find a way to balance your hand, study your hand. Obviously, you don't want to have like too much caffeine before you do this because you could be kind of a little bit shaky, right? Ha uh ha. -huh. But, you know, you find a way to balance your fingers. Um, so that's a little bit of purple, more cadmium, and then this will be more purple, and this will be 50 50. Each time I'm wiping off. You know, my brush is wiping off my uh, palette knife and my rag is getting pretty full already, which is okay. That's why I have lots of them. So here I've got my 50-50 and you notice it's quite different than like that mixture of the, the lemon yellow and the purple next door. So this one is a little bit more equality between the purple and the cadmium, although purple is still the darker value. But you can see a little bit more of a, a difference from one square to the next with the color. So with each one, each of these colors that we start to mix up, you'll get a really good, you know, understanding of which ones are best to use together, how little or how much of one to mix with the other in order to get the effect that you want, the color that you want without, you know, you know, making mistakes and wasting too much of your paint because I know it's an investment with paint. And then when we finish, we'll have a nice kind of cool looking grid of colors and something we'll keep around because we can refer back to it and then know exactly, you know, how much we mixed of one color or another. If we like that color, we can return to it, which is nice too, to have that sort of mapping of the color itself. So it's close to 25% as you can get, 25%, 75% versus 50-50. Pretty similar value, but when I look at like the overall tone of it, this one is a bit duller, a bit more gray than the previous one. And so the other thing is that I do want you to paint straight up to the edge of each square because then you're seeing like the true difference between the colors when they meet at that edge. So it shouldn't be a gradient, should be a distinct square for each one of those, okay? So there's my cadmium yellow with the dioxazine purple. And then my next one, I can move on to what we have. The ultramarine blue with yellow ochre and see how that works. So again, I'm pulling my tape off and you can see I got, again, that nice, really clean edge, which I like. 
see the difference between those darker tones. It's pretty distinct and you've got a clear edge there as well. Everyone, I finished up my little experiment with mixing colors and you can kind of see what my results turned out to be. Um, one thing that's important is I want you to list the uh, brand name of the paints that you're using, um, whether it's acrylic or oil. Um, and then also be sure to write specifically what the actual name of your tube of paint color is, is named. Um, cause we're going to be able to, you know, take a look at that history of those names of those paint colors and where they come from. It's going to tell us a lot about, you know, how they work and their mixing properties and things like that. Um, the other thing is that when we get to actually getting down to working on our painting, we're going to start by mixing some grays and look at this, you know, mixing these colors straight across from each other on the color wheel is going to tell us a lot about, you know, how that color be, you know behaves, how dominant it is, how well it mixes with another one, and it's going to really help you be able to make those choices on what to mix together in order to make those sort of neutral tones that we're going to be building our next painting up with. Um, so there's a lot that you know I think we've learned from this exercise. You see very distinctly what those paint colors are, what their tonalities are. Look at the difference between ultramarine blue and phthalo blue. You know, you see that blue, un that red undertone versus the greenish undertone. Um, and those are like little kind of subtleties that, you know, beginners don't necessarily know. And this is really just gonna like cue you in on that, like straight away, how those different things react and respond. And it's gonna help you to make better decisions as we proceed with our paintings and, um, really become really fantastic painters, because that's the goal, right? So I know you can do it, and I'm excited to get started. Hey guys, I totally forgot about the whole washing the brushes thing. So I am going to show you. I've got my array of brushes. I've always got a lot of brushes to wash. That's just me, and in general, you should Think about the variety of brushes that you're wash you are using. I've got my dirty solvent, um, which is fine. Um, just paper towels to lay things down with. But um, those of you that haven't like worked with oil paint before, and you're washing brushes first. Look at my hand; it's blue. 
Um, but that's because what I'm doing is I'm turning the water on, which I have in front of me, and my lovely dish soap, put it in my hand, which is blue because my brush was blue. And then I take this, I dip it in the solvent, and then I scrub it on my hand, and then run it under the water. Here's my hand off. Um, but I do this several times until I see that there's no more color coming out with the soap that I put in here. I'm doing it again. See that? So taking care of your brushes is super important. You know, you spend money on your brushes, so you do wanna you know, make sure that you wash them well and treat them nicely because they are your amazing tools just as nicely as you treat your computer, right? Yeah, definitely worth the money. So that's super important. And now I think we're ready to get going with some real painting, right? <laughs> Bye, see you next time.